So welcome to chemical information retrieval. Basic idea of this class is by the time you're done with it, you should be able to find pretty much any chemical information that you're looking for, and you should be able to communicate what you find to other chemists. And that sounds like it should be easy, but it actually isn't, and there's a lot of uh, potholes in this process, and that's really what we're going to step through. Okay, so the first thing you're gonna, I'm going to demonstrate today, that's really the point I want to get across, is finding reliable chemical information can be really hard. Yes, you can do a Wikipedia search and get a number, but the question is, how confident are you that that number is good enough for your application? If you only go to Wikipedia or you only go to one source, then really you have no idea. And so what you need to do is to get as many different sources as possible to see what reality is. And I really want you to feel that you can never trust any data source, no matter how reputable, no matter if it's you know, the most highly cited. All of that doesn't mean that a single data point inside of the database isn't wrong. And that actually happens more often than you might think. So that's, that is important for you to uh, know. But the reality is, is that there are things you can do, right? So I'll teach you how you can do the best with what you have. And sometimes there's no measurement, and so you have to go to a model. And so we'll take a look at that, and what are the pros and cons about that. Again, it all depends on your application. Okay, I'll, so I'll show you one application where the exact number is actually pretty important, and maybe another one where it's not as critical. So one of the things, I'll, I'll get to the assignments after I go over the class wiki, is you guys will be looking up chemical properties. I put up 500 molecules that um, are outliers in a couple of databases that we have. Um, so what you need to do is basically look up things like melting point, like log P. I'll give you an actual list for you to look at. And you need to do 25 of these. And ultimately, they will look like this. This is actually a pretty large sheet. But uh, this, this was done in uh, 2010, for example, just to take a snapshot. So DDT, okay, we're looking at the boiling point. So you can see here that there's a problem, right? We've got 260, 110, 260, 260, 416. So the, this is actually not that unusual. The last one's a predicted, so we'll leave that one out for now. But basically, this happens actually pretty often. And one of the problems with this particular data set is if you have the exact same number repeating over and over again, that actually is almost certainly from the same source. So you would not count the 263 times. So that's going to be one of your challenges. If, if you do a, a Google search for your compound, you may end up with 100 hits that say, 260. You can only use that once. And that's, that's just the way it is these days. Sometimes we can spot where a problem happened. Can anybody spot this? Can you see what probably happened in this case? Why well, we got a 110? Yeah, my guess would be that it was actually listed as Celsius and somehow the units got to Fahrenheit. Because, you know, that's close. But who knows, right? But this is really the point, is for you to, to get all these data sources and to make a, a judgment for yourself. If we look at the, the kinds of deviations that we can get, so this is from 2010. If we look at the standard deviation over the average for the melting points, for example, a couple of these actually so, uh, stand out pretty loudly. And here's an example. Okay, so EGCG is a pretty big molecule. Anybody know what it is? It comes from? It's got all these phenolic OHs around it. So it's, it's listed as an antioxidant in green tea. It's the main component of that. So you'll see that with antioxidants, they often have these uh, phenolic rings. And in this particular case, if you look at the melting point, you've got in Kelvin, 414 and 491. It's an enormous difference. Now, if you were going to go by how reputable the source is, well, you've got a peer-reviewed journal in one case, and you have a commercial database in another. 
And generally, those are some pretty good sources, right? If you had, if you had only found one data point from a peer-reviewed journal and you couldn't find anything else, I would say, you know, you're probably pretty good. Merck Index is one of these sources you guys probably heard of. It's, you know, one of the most trusted sources, but we have a problem here. They can't both be right, obviously. So that's the kind of thing that we're, we're facing. And the same thing with cyclohexanone. We have a bunch of different sources. And sometimes enough of them aggregate that you can clearly spot an outlier. And that's something that we have to work on. So where are you going to end up finding these uh, data points? So this happens to be the frequency for 2010. Uh, Sigma Aldrich and Alpha Acer are chemical companies. So this is a place that chemists often get certain kinds of information, like melting point. Uh, I remember as a grad student, this was before the internet, so basically you didn't have much choice. And you know, a, a catalog like Sigma Aldrich or Alpha Acer would be a good place to find a melting point. So these will come up frequently from um, Google searches. And I, I, there's, no, there's no problem with using Google as long as you can analyze what it is that, that you're hitting. Wolfram Alpha is another site uh, that uh, purports to have chemical information. And uh, we'll, we'll see about that, how it, how it stands up over time. Oxford refers to the MSDS sheets that you might have come across. Those we found are pretty notorious for properties, typically. So, But that's the order of frequency. Now, this is the final place where the data was found. So, for example, if somebody went into Wikipedia and it said, you know, 36 degrees, and then there was an actual reference, right, you would not list the source as Wikipedia. You would keep digging until you get to the ultimate source. Okay, so this is not the means to finding information. It's, the, it's where there's no more links. Okay. So some of the things that are changing, this class changes every year. There's some new things that happen. One of the big things, um, Alpha Acer, the, the second most uh, searched site, actually donated all of their melting points, like about 13,000 melting points, to the public domain, what we'll call open data. And we're definitely going to talk about that, the different copyright issues with publishing, what, how can you reuse data. Open data is basically the most open that you can be. People can use the information for any purpose, including commercial. So if you find an open data source, sometimes referred to as CC0, it's a Creative Commons license. Uh, there's absolutely no restrictions on it. And we'll find out that there's all kinds of different uh, copyright licenses that do have restrictions. But So this is open, and so uh, we were able to actually use this to build models, and that's something that we're going to come across later. Uh, so with enough data, uh, you can actually build little interfaces. So I'm going to give you a couple of snapshots, and then when it's actually going to be time for you to do the work of finding information, I'll show you a place where you can access these. So there's not one or three interfaces. There's actually different interfaces depending on how you want to use it. So if you want to do a substructure search, right, there's a smarts uh, code that you can put in here. And so smarts and smiles are things that we're going to talk about. And those are critical for finding chemical information. And just doing just like an, just a simple substructure search, you need to know how to use smarts. And so we have these, these interfaces. They're pretty convenient. So I do want to go a little bit more into the outliers. Like, what do I mean by that? Like, how bad can it be when you're looking for information? So there's a, there's a bunch of different databases for melting point, for example. And there's one called MDPI. This is about 4,200 uh, melting points, if I recall. And you can see here where you actually have a clustering, right? So the numbers, there's many more numbers that are close to 76 or 77. And then there's one that's 150. So at this point, you can start to think that probably the 150 is not, is, is an actual outlier and that you shouldn't use it. But before that, if you only had the 150, you have nothing to go on. So that's why it's so important to get all these different sources. Um, EPI, so this is another database that the EPA also donated to the public. We have a similar kind of situation with phenyl salicylate. We have Alpha Acer, which is a company catalog. 
43. We have another chemical vendor, 42, and then 130. It, so there is a possibility that if we keep getting numbers that the, we're going to find 131, 132. But at this point, it looks like it's in favor of the 43. But you can see the problem, right? It's really not that clear. So one of the thing, one of the tools you'll come across is if you're going to search, let's say, for the melting point of ethanol, <clears throat> in our collections, we never delete anything. So for ethanol, you see these in red, these were actually uh, marked as do not use. So those were not included in the average. And I think you can agree with me, all of these numbers are extremely close to minus 114. And most of them are different enough. And then you have a minus 144 and you have a minus 130. So this, this is the kind of situation that you want to find yourself in because you have enough, you have some overwhelming evidence that this value is correct. And ironically, the alpha acer which was the, the original um, database, the, the original open data that we got, was incorrect. They had minus 130, and you know, I called them up and asked them, do you know that you have this, this error in your database, and how is that even possible? And what happens is that they would copy you know, from year to year when they make catalogs, and if an, if an error slips in, it, it never gets corrected, right, because there's really no reason to look it up. And so that's one of the things, as chemists, you guys going forward, uh, you have to put a lot of thought and a lot of effort into interpreting the data that you find. Uh, but it is doable in some cases where you can be very certain. So here's another problem. Anybody notice something strange about this table that came from a single database? So these are not numbers that were collected from different sources. This is a single source. <laughs> Yeah, the same compound has two different melting points that are, that are really, in some cases, very different. And so even in these cases, you know, you have to be careful and, you know, actually do the analysis. We've also come across situations where the smiles I was talking about earlier doesn't render to real molecules. And so if you're putting it through a model trying to get a prediction, it'll be garbage in, garbage out. And so those are things that I will show you how to analyze. And one of the points about this, the data set that had like two values for the same compound, is it's listed as a high trust level. And this is really, again, a philosophy that I want you to lose in this class. There's no such thing as a trusted source. There may be places that are easier to access, that maybe overall has better data, but there's no such thing as a blessed source that is 100% correct. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. So. Again, no matter what the source is, you need to keep that in mind. So the, the melting points that we collected as open data are available. I'll show you how to access those. And I'm going to tell you a couple of stories that kind of illustrate this point. So we were looking at the melting point for 4-benzyl toluene. And this is very different than the ethanol, right? Remember the ethanol had, you know, maybe 10 values very close to one and then two outliers. This is what we got when we got all the possible sources of melting points. I mean, we exhausted it. So what do you think is the actual melting point? And what would you do to figure it out? We go from minus 30 to plus 125. They can't both be right. So again, this is this is the problem is that you know a government database is usually pretty good. Yeah, you, you can't really go by the, the quality of the source. That's that's the first thing. Yeah, you throw that out the window. They're all equivalent at this point, anyway. Could you just buy the chemical and then test it yourself? Yeah, and that's what we did. We bought the chemical, and so the first thing is that. It was either going to be a, a solid or a liquid, and it was clearly a liquid, right? So immediately, we were able to knock off the 125, uh, the peer-reviewed journal. So we were able to knock off a couple of these, but still, we didn't know if it was minus 30 or 5, or 5 down here. Okay, so this is exactly what we did. We, we 
got the liquid, and we took an NMR to make absolutely sure it was pure and everything lined up. And we were able to freeze the thing with some dry ice. So we were able to go from liquid to solid. And so, so basically, it can be frozen uh, below minus 30. So at this point, it actually turns out to be really tricky to measure a melting point below room temperature. Now, if your melting point is 55, it's no problem, right? You put in a capillary, put it on your melting point apparatus, heat it up. But think about what you'd do if the melting point was below room temperature. You can't take your whole apparatus and put it in an ice bath, right? So it's actually really tricky. And the first time that we did this, so we basically recorded it all in, in this open notebook. And so one of the things we'll be talking about is open notebook science as one way of recording information where you put all the details. Okay, so in that case, um, we left it in the fridge for two days, part, part of that experiment, and it didn't freeze. Okay, and I actually went and gave a talk and actually showed that the melting point probably was closer to minus 30. It's actually pretty difficult to get to exactly minus 30 with, you know, equipment that's easily available. And then when I got back from the conference, frozen in the freezer at minus 15. So you have to be careful, right? Now, all this information, the way that we recorded, it's in a lab notebook. So if we say that it froze, you can tell actually, yeah, it wasn't frozen in two days, but it was at 16 days. And so based on that information, and by redoing, uh, remelting very, very slowly over a whole afternoon, we were able to get a number that was actually pretty close to five Celsius. So we were able to knock off the minus 30 and then confirm that the value is closer to five. So this is a good example of how it's not trivial to get good information sometimes. Okay, so the point here is that there really isn't anything as a fact. There's really only measurements embedded within assumptions. And the problem with a lot of the data that you're going to find is you will not have access to the lab notebook where it was done. You'll have no idea how fast they heated it or the purity of the sample. You'll just get a number and you got to deal with that. Okay, so uh, you'll never actually have a fact. So let me give you another example for synthesis. So we wanted to make these compounds. This is an aldol condensation. And uh, basically as uh, in the taxol receptor, they basically were predicted to bind in the taxol receptor. And so these are the two compounds. This top compound, um, searching reaxis, which we're gonna get into, there's no hits. So it hasn't been reported in the peer reviewed literature, but this one actually has. So you would think if you find a synthesis in a peer-reviewed journal that you're good to go. Well, this is what happens sometimes. So in this example, anybody see what information is, critical information is missing? So I don't know if you've ever tried to dissolve sodium hydroxide in ethanol. Sodium hydroxide dissolves nicely in water, but ethanol, how much ethanol do you need to add? And that's actually a huge question because if you go way too dilute, the kinetics of the reactions is going to change dramatically. And these guys are saying that they got it in an hour. So where you know you're missing that information and it's not it's not trivial. Another example is there's a reference to a synthesis, which is uh, organic syntheses. And that, that's actually a very good source because it's it's the only one that I know of where actually researchers independently reproduce the work. I think they have to do it three times. The problem is it's not the right compound. It's benzaldehyde. So what they basically said is we just, we just used the procedure described in this paper, but the problem is that this is not soluble in the solvent that was used in this paper. So it's a big problem. Now, the thing is, this, this reaction has been done. Somebody knows what happened, but it's just not, you're not able to get it. You might try emailing the author, and that definitely is something I would encourage if there's missing information like that. But, you know, if we can't, if it's, the paper's too old, then you have to uh, do your best. So this open notebook that we have, we index. And in this example, 
we record the the failed experiments as well as the successful ones. So here's an example where uh, Matt was following a procedure in one to six ethanol water, and it didn't work. The procedure probably a typo somewhere, but the benzaldehyde just wouldn't dissolve. But that's useful information. So, you know, this class is half about finding information and it's half about communicating information. So I would encourage you as you go through papers and whatnot, the stuff that you'd like to be there, you know, when you're reporting things, you know, think about that as to, as to, make, to make life easier for people trying to repeat your experiments. So Matt did, in fact, successfully make this compound, but had to go completely get rid of the water, switch from ethanol to methanol, an order of magnitude more dilute, 0.01 molar, 81 equivalents of sodium hydroxide in three days. So that's not a trivial adaptation of the organic synthesis procedure. So even in synthesis, even if a compound has been reported as being made, sometimes it's really, really hard to get information. And you've got to do things like search for analogs. Okay, so you could, you could do a substructure search. So if the compound you're trying to make hasn't been made or the, it, you know, it's not reported well enough, look for analogs, and that's a substructure search that I'll show you how to do in Reaxis. Okay, I talked about models uh, earlier on. So there's lots of models that you may come across. If you use a website called ChemSpider, it's going to be one of the primary sources of, of information. There are tons of predicted descriptors. And it's okay to use them, but you have to know that you're using a predicted descriptor, not an experimental one. So models are fine, and generally, if you have absolutely no experimental numbers, then obviously it's great to find a model, but you have to understand that models work only with a range in, in a range of the chemical space. And so they, they can be useful, but you have to be careful a little bit. So I'm going to go through all these different interfaces. Um, they can be created just with a, a URL. And in this case, for example, uh, benzoic acid, right, you can see here we have a pretty good collection. It's probably close to 122. Uh, but the one thing you can't tell, I mean, it, it averages 122.35, but we don't really know that it's 0.35, right? I mean, there's simply just not enough information. So it's, it's around 122. Uh, and that's really all, all that you can do because multi points are not reported any more accurately. But there's also a prediction service. So our predicted is 108. And that's actually pretty good for what you want to use it for. I'll show you at the very end uh, recrystallization app where predicted melting point is good enough to tell you if you, sh if you should use a solvent or not. But if you are trying to, let's say you have a sample that you think is benzoic acid, and all you have is the uh, predicted, you can't use that to say, that because 122 is too far away from 107 for an experimental, okay? So it all depends on the application as to whether you care or not. Okay, so you can also do a query as to give me all of the solvents uh, where vanillin, uh, the, the solubility of vanillin has been measured. So that's simply a, a URL link that you can copy, paste, send to someone, and it will actually give you the average. So in this case, the average of five measurements in ethanol, and then you could click on this to get the actual sources. So these are, these are the resources that are available to you depending on what it is you want to do going forward. Another thing I want to talk about briefly is uh, the use of Google Spreadsheets. So. Google has made available, I think it's probably a little more than a year now, Google App Scripts, which are kind of like VBA for Excel. It's code that you can actually have running behind the scenes in any Google spreadsheet. And what we've done is actually created an, an interface where if you, let's say you want a melting point, you just type in acetone and then hit a button and the melting point will show up in your Google spreadsheet without you having to leave it. Okay, so... Basically, it's like this. <clears throat> so if you have the sheets, you will have these drop-downs, and you would just hit get melting point, and then you'd have to specify the cell where the name is, right? So you'd have to specify whatever, 8, eight 7, and then it would just report. And then you have a link here where if you click it, it would actually take you to all of the uh, sources, you know, like I showed you earlier with, with ethanol. 
right? So this is after you click it, the number comes in. So if you're interested in these, the, again, that'll be on this site that we're going to cover shortly. Okay. So let's get a little bit more real now and talk about, let's say that you were responsible for studying the relationship between uh, alcohol chain length and melting point, and you couldn't make a mistake, right? So that's, that's actually a big problem. Any suggestions how you might do that? I mean, any of you can go to Wikipedia in five minutes and do this, right? But how do you know that the Wikipedia number is good? So let's say you can only find three data points. Well, out of everything, which is not infrequent. So there's a problem, too, because you'd have to have access to extremely precise equipment. And that's not really, that wouldn't be commonly available. Because we're, we're talking about melting points of liquids here. And I can attest from our own experience, it's really, really difficult. So, yeah, you probably wouldn't have the option to do it yourself. Well, below, below room temperature is the problem. Yeah. Yeah, they exist. I haven't come across any. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. It seems to be a problem. <laughs> yep. It's definitely a problem. So basically what I'm trying to get you to do is to think about your thresholds. Okay, so in this particular application, what we were looking for was a threefold, three numbers that were within five degrees. Okay? Now you could say, I want ten numbers. Well, you're not going to get ten numbers. That's the problem. So you have to you have to pick a realistic range, but it, that's still a fairly high standard to, to to pass. But the point is, is that we know it, right? So like for ethanol, we were talking about minus one fourteen. So this is a great case. We have much more than three, and they're actually much closer than three degrees, right? So but we actually know that. Okay. Now let's take a look at this. Let's say you're building a model, melting point model. And you want to see how good it is. So the experimental here is the, is the one in blue. And when I first saw this, it's kind of surprising that you'd have a sawtooth pattern like this. And it's also surprising that the, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, the five carbon is, has the lowest melting point of all for uh, straight chain carboxylic acids. But we're very confident that that is actually correct because we have triple validated measurements, okay? So because these are such simple compounds, we were able to get enough measurements, and we do know that that is, in fact, reality. So if our model gives a, a sawtooth pattern like it does here in red, that's actually real. That's part of what it should look like. Same thing with the straight chain alcohols we were just talking about. Surprisingly, the lowest point is at the three carbons. So there's a dip, and then it comes up. Now. If you had just gone to Wikipedia and gotten the values from uh, methanol to decanol, I would say that you have a problem here, right? But because we have the triple validation, we can be sure. Now, here's an example where we don't have the triple validation, and this can happen definitely. So if you look at the blue, this is the experimental, right? And the predict is in red. So this works out pretty good. This is good. This is good, but there's a problem at this point. But this data point for cyclobutyl amine there is only one melting point reported, minus 4 Celsius. Now, if you do a Google search, you'll probably get 100 hits at minus 4, but it's all the same number because databases just keep copying each other. So that's a problem. Okay, so we, we'd have to, in that case, probably order the stuff. There's no shortcut to it, right? You simply don't know if this number is real or not. Now, there are some convenient temperatures, like a freezer is minus 15. So if you leave it in the freezer for two weeks, you can see if it turns solid or not. You can, you know, at least see if it's consistent with minus 4. But, but this is the problem. And a lot of you are going to go on to jobs where, you know, you're asked to look up chemical information and, and use it. You need to understand when you, what you don't know. And this is an example where we know that we don't know. 
So here's another example where we found a mistake in Wikipedia, but it's a, it's actually a lot of work to find out, right? So if you go on the, I don't know if this has been fixed yet, but if you go to the table of alkanes, minus 172 for ethane. So we know from the collections, right, this minus 172 comes from a paper or uh, an MSDS sheet, but the overwhelming number of values is much closer to minus 183. That's why we know that this is an error. And that's the only way to know that. And that's a lot of time. We've got to look up all this information. The good thing is that once you looked it up and you've put it into the system, you never have to look it up again. Because by using these tools, it'll, it will pop up all of these values. And then you can remind yourself that you actually know that it's an error. But you can see the problem here, right? Students just copying Wikipedia. It's just, there's no way that you'd spend a whole afternoon getting three values for these. And then that gets published. And then, you know, these errors just keep creeping into the literature. That's why there's a big problem. So anyway, all of these things, if you want to access them, are on the ONS Web Services. We'll take a look in a bit. So there are a bunch of things that you guys can do with all of these services that was not possible before. One of the things is that you can recommend the solvent for a reaction. So if you have st uh, starting materials that are solids and you want this solubility to be fairly high, obviously, and you want after you mix it that your product just precipitates out, then you can actually use the solubility predictions or measurements if they're available, and you can recommend certain solvents like di diethyl ether would be a good solvent for you to use. So every year, as more and more of these become available, you, you can do things that you weren't able to do before. Because picking a solvent for a reaction is really trial and error for the most part. I mean, you look up a paper, if somebody's used ether, you're probably going to use ether as a starting point yourself. And if that doesn't work, then you go to another solvent. And so with, with new information comes new possibilities. Okay, and you can even uh, sort for green solvents, solvents that have less of an effect on the environment. Those numbers are becoming more available. Okay, so I was talking about a situation where you need a predicted melting point. It doesn't have to be dead on. Like if it's 122 and the model predicts 108, that actually can be useful in an application like this, which is a picking a recrystallization solvent. So we actually have an app now. If you look at the bottom here, you can you can check it out. You basically put in your identifier. Now, that can be a common name like benzoic acid, but it can also be some of the things you might not know about now, like smiles, inchies, inchy keys, chem spider IDs. All of those are identifiers. There are ways of labeling molecules so that you know exactly what you're talking about. And you can put that um, in the identifier, and then there are some defaults, minimum solvent boiling, maximum solvent boiling, minimum percent yield. And one that's actually more important than you might think, the minimum concentration at boiling. So if it requires, you know, if you have a too low of a, of a concentration at boiling, it's going to take a lot of solvent to do your recrystallization. That's wasteful. And it's also more difficult to do the recrystallization. So this basically just uses all of the different services that we've been talking about today so far. And it's going to give you some solvents. It's going to recommend some solvents. And if you click on one of those solvents, it will show you the predicted temperature curve, so the solubility at different temperatures. So if you had set up going from boiling to 25, you can quickly see at zero degrees in, in an ice bath, you know, could you bump up your recrystallization yield or not pretty quickly. So again, another tool. Uh, many of these numbers are predicted, and you need to understand that, right? So it's good enough for picking a solvent, but not good enough for identifying you know, benzoic acid melting at 122. And there's also um, log P MSDS sheets and uh, melting points on that app. So basically, this is where all of these, we're going to work through these, all, these uh, services as we need to. So here's what, here's what we're going to cover. First of all, the basics, how to search what some people call the Science 1.0 resources. So those would be, of course, the peer-reviewed journals, the commercial databases, the patents, even conference proceedings. So that hasn't changed, you know, since I was in school. That's still there and it still exists. But there's more stuff now. So there's also what some people call Science 2.0, which 
which is you can think of it as being participatory. So, you know, things like wikis, blogs, interactive database like ChemSpider. Uh, ChemSpider, if you've used it, you might not know that actually you can fix things. If you spot something that you know is an error, you can actually curate it. So ChemSpider is different in that sense from other databases. And we will have the founder of ChemSpider come November 2nd to uh, give you guys a, a talk, Tony Williams. And then there's social software like uh, Twitter and FriendFeed and all these different things. So one of the things now that's maybe different, you know, like when I was in school, you know, there wasn't even an email. So now you can actually email or contact the researcher to figure out, you know, I can't repeat your experiment. You know, can you help me out? So this is something that's available to you. And, uh, you know, we will talk about that as to what's, what's available. And then there is something emerging that people call Science 3.0 which has to do with machine readability. So like Twitter, for example, you can type anything and it's meant for human consumption. But in the Science 3.0, it's all these data feeds that are only machine readable. And it enables you to do, for example, do a recrystallization app where the user doesn't see what's going on in the background. But that's what it's doing is it's, it's reading these sources. So that's a way to think about that as Science 3.0. So what I do now is we'll take a look at the wiki and we'll talk about your assignments and what you'll actually be doing in the class. So if you can anybody not bring a computer? A couple people. Uh, I mean, it's fine with me if you work in groups because we're going to have sessions where I'll walk around and try to help you with your structures. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get a classroom with computers this year, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to make do. I mean, we can use my computer if it's a couple of students, but uh, if you want to pair up with people that have laptops, you know, that that would be fine with me. Uh, so, yeah, if you do have a laptop, you can head over kminfo2012.wikispaces.com. Which looks like this. Okay, so basically, this is your uh, critical information, my email here, if you need to contact me. Just step through the syllabus here. Um, assuming your slides are available. Yeah, I'll make them available. Okay, so I don't want to, I think I've already been through a lot of this, but yeah, basically the course objectives, grasp of chemical literature and the electronic databases, Cost and value of chemical information. So that's actually something you might not realize. I mean, being a Drexel student, you have access to these very expensive databases um, like SciFinder and Reaxis <clears throat> that other people don't have access to. And so there is a cost to information. So earlier on, I talked about open data. Well, there is actually a lot of non-open data that you have to pay for. And, you, and I have lists of those so you can um, distinguish teach you how to search the information. And then there's a component for scientific writing. When we get the assignments, we'll talk about an essay that you need to put together. And uh, that's 60% that's of your grade. So it's really important that you, know, you understand what I'm expecting. There's no textbook. Um, I'm also not going to be using BB Learn. This is it. It's just basically this wiki where you'll put your uh, assignments. So I think I've been through a lot of those. Let me see if I missed anything. Yeah, we, we should have Peggy Domini, the chemistry librarian here at Drexel, come and give you a talk about bibliographies and some of the tools that you can use, pros and cons. Um, we are going to talk about uh, databases and how to search them. I talked earlier about smarts and smiles. So if you don't have those skills, then you're missing out on being able to search a big part of chemistry. So SciFinder will use one of the slight problems with SciFinder is there's only four seats for the whole university. So that's a little bit problematic in a class like this. Uh, luckily, Reaxis actually works really well for properties. If you're working on properties, that should not be an issue for the most part. But uh, yeah, you might not be able to access SciFinder when you want to. But usually, you know, we, we can access it. 
unless it's a class like this where everybody goes on at the same time. So just wait until, if you can't get on, just wait an hour or two. Uh, we'll look at citation searching. So this is actually a pretty good trick. If you want to find out what's being done in a particular area, or let's say even just a compound. So if you find a seminal paper, like the first person to make this compound, you can ask a question, what are all the papers who cite this seminal paper? And that's a really useful search because it's not keyword based. So if the person didn't type in the keyword that you know you think they should have, it's still going to work. So it's going to be, you know, what whatever people are doing with this compound, this reaction, this whatever, and that's a good way to make sure that you don't miss any of the literature. Uh, we'll talk a bit about biological substances like uh, proteins, DNA. So those are completely different databases. So far, we've been talking about organic chemistry, but if you're looking for DNA or enzymes, all that is, is a complete different system, and I will introduce you to that. We'll talk a little bit about patents and patent claims and what that actually means. Safety information. And like I mentioned, we will be talking about uh, copyright issues like open access. That's actually becoming quite prominent now. Open access journals. What does it mean actually? Uh, you know, are they peer reviewed? Are they not? Um, What's the impact factor? All these things we're going to go over. And uh, here's the grading. So the homework assignments are 15%. There's three assignments, 5% each. I will show you in a minute. There's a final, which is 25%. And I actually posted the prior year's final, so you, there's no surprise. It's basically all going to be from these FAQ sites that I will show you. And the research project is the essay, which is 60%. Okay, so the research project, 3,000 words, okay, and yes, I will count them, so make sure you have 3,000 words, not including the references, so just the text that you write. Uh, topic of your choosing, I really don't care, I mean, as, if it's something you're interested in that's related to chemistry and that actually requires you to use the databases, that's sort of the point of the class, so... It happens sometimes that you're interested in a project, but you can't really use any of the databases, and you know, that's kind of problematic. So definitely talk to me when you're picking your project. Um, and use the bibliographic techniques that you learn in this course. So this is actually really important. It happens when I teach the course that students are doing well, and then there's a big drop off with the paper because like, for example, they didn't use DOIs, which we'll, we'll talk about, which is a link that should take me directly to the paper. And if I don't have that link, if I don't have something to click on, I can't verify what you said in the paper, and so I have to deduct a lot of points for that. So make sure, I mean, it's due at the end of the course. Try early on to make sure that at least you have the right formatting so that that's not going to be the problem, right? That's extremely important. Uh, you should have at least 20 references. So most of your references really should be peer-reviewed publications. Uh, you could have a, a link to Wikipedia if it's relevant. It's all context-dependent. Um, most of your references should be to peer-reviewed papers. But again, you will you know there are times where it's obvious that um, another source is more appropriate. Uh, yeah. So like I said, you need to have that DOI. Now, articles that are not available electronically, so it might happen that you'll have to get an interlibrary loan. That might actually happen for your uh, properties more than your paper, actually. And those, because of copyrights, you know, we can't put them openly. Okay, so we're going to encrypt them. I still want a link, but we're going to encrypt them inside of a zip file. Easy to do upload them to the wiki, and then I can verify your statements in the paper. Okay, so generally, you may not even, most of you probably won't need to get an interlibrary loan, but if you do, we're definitely going to cover that. That can happen for, you know, older papers and other languages sometimes. 
Now there is a multimedia creative option. So again, I'm pretty flexible with this. If you would like to do uh, just a bunch of stuff that students have done, um, like do a presentation, record a 10 minute presentation about your project, that you know we can talk about reducing a thousand, you know, a thousand words from the final. So again, very, I'm pretty flexible on it. Let's see if we have uh, an example here. Yes, I think I think the student actually built this model from 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 scratch using you know his software. So you know that's a good application if you're actually building something. Um, yeah, so there's there's a bunch of things that you can do, and we can certainly discuss it. So the project deadline. Saturday, December 8th at 9 a.m. So you're going to be putting your um, essay on a wiki. So what that means is literally at 9 a.m. I'm going to walk the wiki. So whatever is done or not done, that's it, because I have to grade it before the exam week is over. So make sure that, you know, you understand the formatting, all, all this stuff before beforehand, because that's exactly when I'm going to walk it. Um, so yeah, especially don't depend on SciFinder the day before your assignment is due because you might not be able to access it. So plan ahead for SciFinder for sure. Okay, now I'm going to ask you before we meet again next week to create a couple of wiki pages. So one of them, I'll show you examples, one of them will be basically your name. We'll talk about that. And the other one would be your name, then LOG log. So the log is if you, for example, have an idea for a project and you want to discuss it, you can jot down any ideas. And I'll, I get an alert when you put something there, then I might go in and respond. Uh, all your other assignments that we're going to get to in a minute, you would do in your log. So, you know, finding properties and things like that. Now, the, the one which, which is just your name or some students put their name in and final, that one is only your final essay, cleaned up final essay. So there should be nothing else there except for your essay with the figures and, you know, bibliography, all of that. So one of the things, too, is that I don't want any formatting at all on the wiki. So if you're, let's say you're using Word to write up the essay, that's fine. But when you copy, paste it into the text editor, not the visual editor. Because if you copy, if you just if you put in the visual editor, that which which is the default, it's going to copy all kinds of formatting, and then it's almost impossible to make changes to it without messing everything up. So I'll show you what I mean by that. With the so no no formatting, no colors, nothing. Just heading one, plain text. That's all that that you should have. Okay. Now this is a big issue, and I really want you to think about this usernames. So you need to understand this is a public wiki. That means it's indexed in Google. It means that you know if you use your real name, people will be able to Google you and they will come across this. So you want to think about if you if you really want to use your real name or not, you don't have to. If you want, you can use your initials or even a pseudonym, something that nobody could guess that it's you. You just have to tell me what it is, obviously. Okay. But think about this because, I mean, you can't really undo it, you know, once it becomes indexed. Um, you know, discuss it with me if you have any questions. But actually, are there any questions about that? Okay, because you're going to have to create a username. You don't have to do it today, but by, by next week on Wikispaces, create a username if you don't have one, and then create those two pages, the one with your name. Uh, and... So if you if you actually if you take a look at the other years, I'm not going to put any critical comments on your essay. Okay, if I have something to say that's remotely critical, I will email you directly, or we'll talk about it in class. So you might not see there's anything graded again because I want to respect that. Make sure that you know you're not worried about that. But again, it is not a problem if um, you want to use a pseudonym. There's no format. I'll, I'll show you after we go through. Um, 
these links. I'll go to the previous year to show you how, how the students did it, and then I'll be a good enough example. But yeah, I mean, it's basically, after you have an account, you have to, well, the way it's set up right now, there's, there's no login, because I don't want to have to approve 35 people. So go in now, the thing with the wiki, you guys, I would assume, are reasonably familiar with them by now. Uh, you know, some bozo can come along and change your page, right? But there's a version history, so we can revert back. That hasn't been a problem so far. Um, you know, we can lock pages. I can make you guys log in. But right now, there's, there's nothing stopping anyone from creating a page. So I want to make that part easy. But that, that can be changed if we, if we have problems. Okay, we just looked at the syllabus. Now, here's a link that uh, you should be using shortly. Resources. So there's a couple of services here. Electronic journals at Drexel. All right, that would be the e-journals. And so here, you know, you can if there's a journal that you're looking for, you can actually find it. Let's say... Journal of the... Chemical, right? You don't need the full name, just the first part of it. All right, so Journal of the American Chemical Society. You'll see that there's actually two links. There's two archives. One archive is 1996 to present, and the other one is from 1879 to 1995. So literally, it's the entire journal is available. So if you see, you have a, you know, you have a reference that's in JAX, that's great because you're guaranteed to have access to it. No problem. It'll come right here. Generally, the way that the links work, like a DOI, which we'll, we'll get into, you bypass this entire system. Okay, so let's say you do a Reaxis search, it'll say full text available. Usually you click on it, and then it'll take you to the paper, but sometimes that doesn't work. And so you might have to actually come here once in a while. Don't assume that if the link doesn't work in Reaxis, that Drexel doesn't have it, because it happens often enough that you need, you need to check it. And it's not just the journal, but it's also the year range. So you might only have access to certain years. So, um, yeah, you have, you have to go through this sometimes. Okay, so now this is going to work if you're on the Drexel campus. Any, you, you'll be able to access any of these uh, papers if you're on Drexel campus. If you're not, you'll have to install a VPN on your computer that makes it look like you're on Drexel campus, and then you can access all these databases just as well. I have a link to that too. This is the Interlibrary uh, Loan Service, the ILL. So basically, you have to actually log in, and then you'll see fields where you know you put the title of the article, the name of the journal, etc., and they will email you the article as a PDF. Once you get that email, download it on your computer because for some reason I think it disappears after 30 days or so, and then you have it. Now you need to understand copyright restrictions, so it can be you can't make that public. So just make sure you, that you never upload a raw PDF like that unless it's an open access journal, which is the whole point of open access journals. But if it's American Chemical Society, you cannot do that. Um, I think as undergrads, you, have, you guys have a limit of 10 graduate students, I think 20 ILLs per term. So you shouldn't need more than 10. I mean, if there's one or two, that, that's pretty normal. Okay. Now, under databases, I have them grouped in two categories, right? There's the pay services, Drexel subscribes, and then there's the free services. So there's actually a link to a list of chemistry databases at Drexel. You can take a look here. Uh, sometimes I'm looking for something and it's not in this list. So if you don't see it in this list, go to the all databases because sometimes things are classified as chemistry versus chemical engineering. So, but the, you know, if you just want a real quick look up, this this can be handy. SciFinder. All right, so again, we got four uh, simultaneous seats, and I, th I think you need to create an account the first time. Reaxis is great, because if you're on the campus, you don't have to sign in. It'll just pop open, and uh, we'll, we'll, if we have time today, we might do a little search. Uh, 
uh, web of science. So this is uh, one that lets you do a citation search I was telling you about earlier. So if you have a paper you want to find out who has cited it, uh, web of science is, is uh, probably your first choice. Okay, there's also like CRC handbook. Okay, so I, I don't know if you guys have seen this or not. I mean, that's pretty classic. All Organic Chemists It's a, a big black book. And now, of course, it's electronic. So one of the problems with this thing, though, is that you can't create a URL to a compound, which is really annoying. So if you get a property from uh, the CRC, that's fine. But you are going to have to take a picture of it and crop it, and I'll show you how to do all that stuff. But yeah, unfortunately, the only link you can put is is what I have up here. So it's a, it's a little inconvenient, but that's it is what it is. But that's definitely a good source for properties. And Merck Index, same same deal basically. So the Merck, yeah, the Merck Index. Anybody know what the difference would be between the Merck Index and the CRC handbook, if you've used either one of them. Well, the Merck, the Merck Index, I think, is limited to 10,000 useful compounds every year. At least that's what it was uh, when I looked it up. So the idea is going to be a lot of biologically relevant compounds, things like that. The CRC handbook is more exhaustive, so it's going to have you know, sections for organic compounds, inorganic compounds. The Merck Index might have a couple of inorganic compounds, but it, it wouldn't be your first search for that. So, you, you know, you need to get used to what the different databases cover. You'll only know that by trying them. So that's pretty much, that's a summary of the uh, pay services. I think the most useful of all of these is probably Reaxis for most of you. Now, if you're doing a write-up on proteins or things like that, that's going to be a different uh, thing altogether. Now, there's a bunch of these free sites, and I don't want to, you know, spend all of today going through these, but like I mentioned earlier, ChemSpider is uh, the main database, probably. So let's say that we look for warfarin, right, which is an anti-clotting drug. So with ChemSpider, you can search... For the common name, you can search for the chemical name. You can put a smile, an inchy. All these things we'll, talk, we'll be talking about in detail. It's also a good place if you want to get the smiles and the inchy. It's just here, and you can hit copy. Okay, so you know if you if for whatever reason you need a smiles, uh, and you do actually in one of your um, assignments, this is a pretty good place to get it. And ChemSpider is actually kind of overwhelming sometimes, which is why I'm having Tony Williams come to spend a whole lecture on it. There's a lot of information on here. Some of it is experimental. Some of it is predicted. You really need to go through and understand what it is that you're looking at because there's a lot of numbers and you want to make sure that you're not, for example, using a theoretical number when you're actually looking for an experimental one. So we'll definitely spend more time on that later. And actually, if I can go back to this, when you're linking to ChemSpider, you want to hit this uh, this link, the short link, like this. This is the ChemSpider ID, so that you'll see in some some of the uh, spreadsheets, CSID, it's that number. That's a great number to have because once you have the number, you can generate all the synonyms, you can generate the smiles, everything. So that's generally what I would recommend that you do is try to get your ChemSpider ID to make your life easy. And then, you know, you can populate the rest of your uh, cells. Okay, so I did mention Google. Again, I don't have any problem with trying Google. In fact, if you don't try it, that's not a good idea. You, you should definitely see what's there, but there are some tricks that you need to use. For example, on Google, if you have the CAS number, that's chemical abstracts number, that is often a better way to search Google than with the name or even the smiles for that matter. Uh, because companies tend to use CAS numbers in preference to anything else. 
And then you have some, so now you got to figure out some compounds have multiple cast numbers. So it's not a trivial thing, but if you were going to use Google, you know, that's one approach. Then there's a whole bunch here. I'm not going to step through all of these. Um, you will do that when you're looking for your properties. Uh, let's see, there's a bunch of other stuff here. ChemSketch is useful for drawing a molecule and you, you need to install it on your computer. It's actually pretty handy for a lot of your chemistry classes uh, and it's free. And uh, well, I'll point out when it is uh, relevant. The Drexel VPN is right here. So this is really quick to install. Once you have it installed on your computer, if you're working from home, it looks like you're on campus and you'll be able to access all the journals, all the databases with no problem. So that's pretty critical for you to get. And uh, let's see if there's anything critical here. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to the rest of this when it's time. Any questions about the resources? Okay, well, it's hard for you to tell until you actually need to do something, but that's where you would look first. Okay, so here's a little more about the assignments. So the first one, 525 properties, this one due November 9th. Now the properties, I gave a, a link here to a little sheet to show you what kind of properties we're talking about. So we got melting point, boiling point, density, vapor pressure, pKa. So some of these will only be applicable to very small numbers of compounds, right? So pKa, what, what, what kind of compounds would have a pKa? Acids, what else? Mo. By acids, I mean referring to carboxylic acids. Anything else might have a pKa? Right, so proteins are going to have a whole bunch of them, right? So you have, might have PK1, 2, 3. So that one, probably most of you won't have to deal with. Uh, but if you do, you know, it's there. And I also put the units here. So you'll see in the sheet in a second, you know, you're going to come across all kinds of different units at the very start. Today we came across Fahrenheit versus Celsius. Obviously, if you want to compare values, you need to have them all in the same units. So there's going to be a column for however it appears in the paper, let's say, right? So 130 Fahrenheit. You need to put exactly the way it appears in the paper in the sheet. Then you convert it to whatever the common unit is. So the common units for temperature is always going to be Kelvin. Uh, density, grams per mil, vapor pressure, and Pascals. How it appears, the units and how the values it appears is what you're yeah, I'll show you the sheets. So you, you're going to have a value from whatever source, right? And it, it'll have units. So you need to put the units and the number. And then, though, you need to convert them to, like, if, if we're in Celsius, there, there's another two, row, two columns, a new, a, what's called the common number and the common units. So no matter how you find the information, you've got to convert it to Kelvin, which, I mean... Most of these conversions are trivial, just Googling the conversion, right? Some of them are not quite as trivial. Like if you get a boiling point at one pressure and you need to get it at one atmosphere, because that's the thing is that, you, you know, if you're reporting boiling points, they all have to be at one atmosphere. And if you find them, they're not at one atmosphere, you need to convert them. So some of them are trivial. Some of them are a little bit more elaborate. Uh, one that's a little tricky, actually, is solubility. I can help you with that. It needs to be in molar. Solubility can be expressed in grams per 100 grams of solution, grams per 100 grams of solvent. There's all these little distinctions, and but ultimately you need to convert them to molar. Uh, let's see, flashpoint and Kelvin. Some of these don't have any units. Refractive index has no units. So nothing to do in that case. The LD50 is a little tricky. So, anybody know what that means? Where 50% of the animals will die, but how long do you have to wait? Me neither. And that's the point, is that 
you have to assume that everybody's doing it the same way because all you're going to get in almost every case is just a number. And I'll show you how the number can vary by orders of magnitude. The other thing is you have to make sure it's the same animal and the same route of administration. So rat oral is the most common, but what would be like some other routes of ad administration? Intravenous. Right, on the skin. Mm -hmm. Intramuscular is a big one. Yeah, you'll... It, <laughs> inhalation sometimes, but of course, you know, if it's not a gas, it'll be a little bit difficult to do that. But IP means what? You'll see that often, IP. It's intraperitoneal, so that's in the abdomen. So, like, a uh, rabies shot would typically be given like that. So, there's a lot of these things, and you can't compare two numbers unless they have all of these things lined up. And some will even go as far as to do males and females, rats, and they'll have different numbers. So, um, a lot of different organic chemicals aren't necessarily looked at for medicinal purposes and don't have that number at all. Do you expect us to get every single one of them? No, these are just examples. Just examples? Okay. Yeah, basically... 25, I will, I'll show you the list of compounds, and it's up to you as to which properties that you want to find, okay? I'm just giving this to you to make it easier to find the properties. Now, this is an open sheet. So, I mean, I have solubility in water here. I have solubility in methanol and ethanol. Obviously, if you find an acetone, we'll add it to the sheet here, okay? So, this is just an example of the different solubilities, and you do have to be specific. So, water solubility... If you find any solubility, it's most likely going to be in water. And then you need to check that they use a buffer. There's all kinds of things that might make your numbers different. So, you know, we'll, we'll go through that. But, yeah, I mean, basically, um, this is a, a place to get started. Luckily, with Reaxis, you can actually search for solubility in all kinds of different solvents. So it's actually easier to search for solubilities in some ways than other properties. So it's, 20, it's these and... I will show you uh, the list here. Okay, I've listed 500 compounds here. Okay, so this is the first list. And let's see the name here. Yeah, you'll have to actually... Sign into your Google account. Yeah, these are set up where you have to actually log in to edit. Okay, so basically, you have a ChemSpider ID here. You have a smiles, and we're going to talk about what these symbols mean. And does, does anyone know, by the way, what these at symbols mean? Well, first of all, how many of you have used smiles? Okay. Well, you'll definitely be familiar with them by the end of this course. Basically, it's a way to represent a molecule just using uh, alphanumerical characters. And these at symbols refer to chirality. So one at, I think R, two at would be S. You know, that's how you would change chirality directly in a smiles. Um so these, for example, you could copy and paste into ChemSpider, but there's already a ChemSpider link, so you can get it from here. But yeah, the idea basically, these are outliers from the melting point and the solubility models. So there's something wrong with the data for these compounds. So I thought this year, since I, you know, I always ask the students to look up properties, might as well do some of these, and then, you know, as you do your work, you will contribute to, you know, do something really useful for the chemistry community. Now, if you, there are compounds that you are dying to do, that's fine, too. Just let me know. I'll try to do at least three of them that are on these lists. But um, there, you know, there might be things wrong with them. That's why I put my comments here. If you have any comments, you could put them here. Like if you find that, <clears throat> let me see if we can pick one compound. Okay, like 2580. Okay. 
I don't know if you can see that. Does anybody see a problem with this compound? Yeah. So that would be an example of where, you know, one of you or I would write, you know, it's not, uh, it's it's not a valid uh, neutral compound. So the problem is though, is that if you go on drug bank and all these other sources, this is what they have. Presumably it's a chloride or some other salt, but all of that gets lost. So you, and the other thing is you should always be doing neutral molecules, right? So if a compound is either as a salt form or as a free base, you're always looking for the free base uh, in these cases. So this is the list. So there's 250 in this list. And I'll show you in a minute where to, where to actually do, do the um, searches. All right, so these are the solubility outliers. So the two lists, it doesn't matter to me which ones you pick, and you do all the properties that you want to from either list, okay? So there's 500 molecules in total, and there's an enormous number of properties, so there shouldn't be a problem that you can't find something suitable. Um, but, yeah, there's nothing special about one list over the other. They're just basically there because if there was a correction, it would be useful, and you got to do a search anyway. So... Um, any questions on this before I show you the, sh the final sheet? Yes. No, 25. So, but the one thing I would say is, so here's, here's the sheet where you actually do it. Uh, oh, where did I put the sheet? It's actually on. So right here. Okay, so this is the actual sheet. I should probably put a link elsewhere too. Yeah. So it, I don't, if you're familiar with Google spreadsheets, they work like a wiki. There's a revision history. So, I mean, technically, someone can't really delete your stuff, but I would say just for convenience, if, if you do some work, you can do file. Uh, download as, I usually download it as Excel. So if for whatever reason something happens, it's easy for you to put it back. Um, one of the reasons that we have to do it together is I don't want a situation where five students do the same compound with the same property. So if there's one that you want to do, uh, you would put your name or the pseudonym next to the, the compound and the property. So what that means, let's say that you pick one of the compounds, you're going to do melting point. What I want you to do is not just get one melting point, but use all the resources we talked about to, you know, use the Google, use the Reaxis, use all of these, and do as many as you can. You need 25 total. That could be 25 for the same compound, all different properties. It could be 25 different compounds, the same property, but that's pretty unlikely. Right. Oh, so it's 25 data points? Data points. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not that big of a deal if you, once you, you know, figure out how to use the systems. So, yeah, so basically before you do something, come on the sheet to make sure that nobody's working on it. You definitely don't want that situation where, you know, we have two students doing the same. So, you know, for each melting point, how many different numbers do we need for that to, you know, find that data point? So, you know, we go to... Uh, Finder, we find a bunch of different ones coming in. For each, we need 25 different melting points. How well, you need 25 different data points. Yeah, sure. But for each data point, how many, how many numbers? As many as you can find. And I can tell you for these compounds, you're not going to find many. So if you find 25 different melting points for these compounds, that's great. But I don't think that's going to happen for any of these. Does that answer your question? Um, kind of. No. Um, I think, I think I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm yeah. confused that, like, we're thinking we're, we are picking 25 compounds or, or 25 data points is the outcome. Okay. So we get, like you said, we can pick 25 compounds to do a monthly for each and every one. 
Well, you could, but I mean, if, if you're doing the melting point for our compound A, I would expect you to do all the melting points. So you do your literature search, right? You might find three melting points. Those would be three data points. And, you know, if they link to the same paper or different paper, it doesn't matter. Or alternatively, we pick one compound, try and find 25 properties of that, which is crazy, but just, but, but for each property, we still have to find all the, like, like if I, if a melting point for that one compound, we still have to list all the, uh, all the different melting points we find for that. Right. You, you pick compound. If you pick melting point, do your best to get all the the melting points you can. If you do a solubility, do your best to do a solubility. And once I show these to you, it's really not that difficult. But I want you to go through and appreciate, you know, how much information you can actually get for these compounds. But yeah, there's not there's not a requirement that they be you know, 25 different compounds or five of the same compounds. It's just 25 data points at the end. And I just want to make sure that if you pick melting point for a compound, it means another student's not going to do that. And so do your best to get as many as you can. And if you're stuck, this is what we're going to do in the workshop time. You know, I'm going to ask you how you did your search and maybe, you know, show you a trick. And, uh, yeah, at the end, you know, the deadline, you need to have 25. And what what will happen is I, I go through these. Let me show you what it, what it looks like from a previous year. This is what it should look like at the end. So this is read only. And you can take a look at this. All right, here's the source value in Celsius, common value in Kelvin. And there's a link. So this is what I meant by DOI. It's a link that goes directly to the paper. So you specify the data source types. So in this example, it's a peer reviewed journal. And in a situation where it's not super obvious where the information is, you crop up a little image like this. So you can see from the, how much you actually need to crop depends on the context. You can see that this is the compound being referred to. This is clearly the melting point. Okay, so in other words, if you just copy the melting point information, how do I know that it's corresponding to this compound? By the same token, if you copy the whole page, I'll be looking forever to find it. So all you need to do is to crop just the information that clearly shows this is the compound we're talking about, this is the reported melting point or whatever property. And if you need to take a table and move stuff around, you know, I can show you how to do that. Usually use paint for this, it's pretty straightforward. Do you take NMR ships as properties as well? Because I've noticed that there's always Yep. Well, we've, we've tried. I mean, part of the problem is that an NMR is not a number. You know what I mean? So it would have to be like the shift of a particular peak. Okay. That's, I mean, we've actually done a little bit of that. Uh, if that's something you're really interested in doing, you can certainly look at it. Um, but you see the problem. I mean, basically, yeah, you have to that's the problem, yeah. But, yeah, if you were looking at a compound and you're looking at the same methyl group, absolutely right. It would be very interesting to see how much it varies. Yeah, it just, it's just, uh, we actually have another sheet for, for that. Maybe we'll talk after. But, yeah, we are looking for numbers. And the, the other thing is, too, what's a property and what's not. So what about molecular weight? I think that's a usable property or not. I've had students try to do that, but there's a reason that you can't. Thoughts? Well, it's basically a calculated property. It's not measured. I mean, yeah, you could say that in the mass spec, you get a number, but I mean, the reality is there's, no, there's, there's nothing to measure, right? We already know what the exact mass is going to be. It has to be an actual experimental measurement. Yes? Yeah, basically, at the end of the day, you need to have 25 of these rows filled out. Okay, so here's an example, the same compound. 
these are all melting. Uh, yeah, this is all the same compound. It has the same kept spider ID. They're all experimental melting point. And here are the values. So you can see there's one of these that is enormously off, right? These are in Kelvin, 518, 515, 516, and then 387. So what I'm going to do is literally make sure that all of this is actually true, right? So for this one, that looks weird. Well, let's actually take a look. We can take a look at the, at the paper. Well, let's take a look at the image. And so I can see that that is the compound. And indeed, it says 114 Celsius. So it's not an error of entry. You know, that is actually there. And then we can click on the link to actually get it from that uh, paper. And uh, that's pretty much it. If you look at the comments, yeah, so basically, if you have anything to tell me, you can put it here. I will put it here, and when it's finished, I will just write done, and there's absolutely nothing left for you to do. So you can, if you're not sure what you need to do, you can take a look at the sheets, and it's basically trying to make sure that we know exactly where the information comes from, and just learning all the me the mechanics of doing it. So basically, we just have to have 25 entries. There. So three data points will help. Mm -hmm. count the three yep. Okay. That, that yep. Just want to make sure everybody is on the same page. Um, okay. Are there any particular properties that we're looking for in particular, or is anything we want to take? Well, one of the things about uh, Reacts is that it actually gives you properties too. So I, I you know, gave you a list to start with. I mean, like, that was that first link. If we're doing useful research, are we actually doing things that we that we definitely want investigated, or we love dogs? I mean, look, if there's a molecule that you're connected to, you want to do absolutely. But I, I mean, like in, in your in your spreadsheets, your two spreadsheets, some of those are are you have no problem that have the current value, you have no problem. With. No, those those two sheets are literally the outliers, the farthest outliers from a melting point model and a solubility model, aqueous solubility. So for whatever reason, the reported melting point, let's say, is completely off from the predicted. Okay. That's why I, I just took, you know, randomly two two fifty. So every single compound you work on, you're fixing the chemical literature. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, next week, we're, I'm going to try to spend as much time as I can one-on-one -on -one with you. As you've had time to start to look at this, I'll sit down and, you know, show you more if you're getting stuck on any of these things. But it is important for you to understand what the expectation is, right? So it's just 25 data points. Okay, um, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but here are some of the web services that I was talking about. So the other important point, it should be obvious, but I'm going to spell it out. You can't use a, a measurement that's already been reported in the, in the databases, right? Because that's by definition. Uh, so if you want to know if it's in the database or not, let's say a melting point, right? That's, you just click on this link and there's actually a bunch of ways to, to do this. Some of these actually require um, ChemSpider ID. So given a ChemSpider ID will actually give you. So if you click on this link, okay, it defaults to benzoic acid. It has a ChemSpider ID of 238. So if you're on ChemSpider, you guys all have the ChemSpider IDs for all the compounds. So you just replace the 238 with your number, and you will see what the, what the current melting points are, if any, for those compounds. So that's the only thing before, you know, we don't want you to redo all of these values because they're already done. You're trying to find values that are. Right. Um, I'm sorry, what, what's, what's in the area? So that this link 
the, the very last link on the home page right here. Okay, so click on that. And then there's links to like melting points or let's say even solubility. Okay, let's so let's say you're you pick a compound and you want to look up new solubilities in different solvents. So how do you know which solvents already have values? And even if they have values, there might be multiple reports for them, right? But so you want to get to the actual report. So for example, by clicking on the second link here of measurements, you literally just have to type the name of the compound. So in this case, cinnamic acid, and it basically shows you all the solvents where cinnamic acid has been measured. Okay, so let's say you look at uh, THF. Okay, so this is actually a value from a lab notebook. So there are no other references with the, the solubility of cinnamic acid in THF. So if, if you were to use Reaxis, SciFinder, Google, whatever, you use, as long as it's not this lab notebook page, if you find five of them, that's great. Okay. So, I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. and Maybe some of it will become clear when you actually start working on it. So if you, maybe over the week before we meet again, if you pick one molecule maybe and, you know, go to Reaxis and try to, to work it out, I can, Give you show you an example of that. Do we have enough time? Okay, so if you're looking for doing a search, right? So you go to resources, hit Reaxis. I'll show you how easy it is to actually do a search. So there's reactions and then there's substances and properties. Make sure that it actually goes here. It doesn't always default to this. So you're looking for substances and properties. And Reaxis does something that the other databases don't do, which is really nice. You have a choice. You can put the common name, you can put an inchy key, you can put a cast number or a smiles. So if you have a compound that's complicated, you probably would use the smiles. But if you have a compound that has a common name, uh, let's say I just pick warfarin again. Right? It will translate it. Okay, so this is what it draws. Now you could have also drawn this yourself with the drawing tool, but uh, this is much easier. And what we're going to do is take a look at substance data. Okay, so we have physical data right here. And you can see your properties popping up right here, right? You've got melting point, boiling point, density, solubility. So let's say we just do melting point. And hit search. Okay, now you still have to think because we're getting multiple hits, right? So we have this, we have this, and we have this. So I don't know if you, if you can see what's the difference between this blue structure and this blue structure. Right. right. You need to be extremely careful when you look at these. You're looking for, is it a salt? That's the most obvious thing. But the other thing is that if there's stereochemistry, are you looking for the cis isomer or the trans isomer? Are you looking for the R or the S or the RR or the SR? So this is this is where it's not trivial at all. You need to actually think about, is this really what I'm looking for? So warfarin, we're looking for the neutral compound is going to be the first one. And then it's pretty straightforward. You just view all the melting points. And there's actually four here. So this is where it can get a little bit tricky because Drexel might not actually have all of these references. So this is where you might end up doing an interlibrary loan. If you click on the full text, I don't even know if this is going to work for this case, but let's see. Okay, this is usually good if it says has the following DOI. Perfect. 
So now you actually have the link to the paper. And the DOI depends on the publisher. For ACS, If generally, if you have a short link, it would be a DOI or the equivalent of a DOI. If it has DOI in the actual link, then you know for sure it's a DOI. In this case, ACS well, it actually has DOI in this case too. So you would just copy this as the link, right? In the sheet, there's a place link. You paste that there. And, you know, you would take an image of wherever it shows up in, in the paper. So that's when it works well. Let's see if the other ones fail here. No, that one works too. That's good. Let's see, it's a little bit older one. Okay, so here's an example where Drexel probably doesn't have it. Again, you want to double check, go to the list of electronic journals, because sometimes Drexel has it, but it doesn't work. But just based on the name of the journal, I, I haven't come across it in Drexel. So this would be a situation where you'd have to decide to do an interlibrary loan or not. So if you're collecting properties, you probably should do it. And the, usually they're pretty quick with the interlibrary loans, uh, 24, 48 hours. It could take a little bit longer. In, the, in that kind of situation, you could, as a placeholder, take the image of the actual temperature listed on Reaxis. But I can tell you from experience that Reaxis has a lot of mistakes there, where the number here, you just don't find it in the paper. So it's actually very important for you to get to the actual paper and not trust the number unless you have absolutely no choice. You're waiting for an ILL. But yeah, that's that's basically how you do a property search on Reaxis. Pretty straightforward, and you can do the same thing for solubility, anything like that. And you can see here, there's a bunch of other properties that I didn't even mention. You got log P information. So a lot of this will depend on your own personal interest. So if you're interested in uh, pharmaceuticals, then something like log P, you know, is, is you, sh you should learn how to find it and how it works and all of that. Um, if you're a synthetic organic chemist, you know, definitely melting point solubility is critical. So there's enough for everybody, I think, that you can get your 25 and have, you know, learn, learn something from it. Any questions? Okay, let me see. Is there anything that I haven't mentioned that you wonder about the course? Yes. Um, I have a question about the interlibrary loan thing. Did you do anything for like lending on the interlibrary loan? Because I know that's something that Drexel has. Yes, I believe it is 10 for undergraduates per term. Uh -huh. I think it's 10 at a time. What's that? 10 at a time. So if you request 7 and you get 4 back, you can request 4 more. And hopefully you don't have 10. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I've never run into a problem where a student has exceeded the limit. So, if it happens, you know, let me know. But Yeah, I think it's 30 days. So, just make a copy on your computer because they, they, they remove the link. Um, Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Oh, yeah, actually, I think I didn't talk about the FAQ on the assignments. Okay, so this is the first assignment, the 25 properties, November 9th. The second one, so in total, these are 15%, so 5% each. Write a summary of one of the articles you're reading for your project, paragraph by paragraph. Uh, one or two sentences, paragraph is fine. So what this means, basically, is you're... you're starting to gather information for your essay, your 3,000 3, words, pick a paper. I mean, if I were you, I'd pick a shorter paper. Pick a paper and just go through paragraph by paragraph, write a couple of words what the paragraph is about. I just want you to actually mentally go through the process of digesting an entire paper so that you understand what each part does. Okay, so this is one thing you cannot do is copy and paste. You know, I'd rather have it in your words with spelling mistakes and all than have to find out that you just copied and paste. So you, sh you should be able to say, I mean, just 
very basic things. Like usually in the first uh, paragraph of any paper, it'll, it'll talk about the state of the art. Like, it, you know, it is well known that this reaction has been used for X, Y, and Z. You, you could just basically say first, first paragraph uh, details the state of the art. I mean, literally just the absolute essence of what each paragraph is about. Okay. So you would put that in your log page, right? So when you get around to it, when you create your name or pseudonym and then LOG log, that's where you would put that assignment. And I will comment directly in the log. So the, the last one is answer the FAQ questions. So the FAQ questions uh, gathered from year to year, things change from year to year too, so there's always new stuff. The exams are actually based on all the FAQs. So I literally just look at the FAQs and make up the test questions. And I'll give you access to the prior year's exam. It's not a big surprise. But here's, for example, FAQ from 2011. We're going to spend more time on this later, but just to give you kind of an intro. So in FAQ, I would prefer that it actually come from you, that it would be something you would have a personal interest in. But if you can't think of anything after a few weeks, I'll give you a question to answer. Here's an example. So explain the American Vets Act passed in September 2011. So I don't know if you guys know about this, but the United States was different from the rest of the world, right? It was first to invent, not first to file for patents. So now this has changed. And so the question is, does it, does it have implications for how chemists keep their lab notebooks, for example? Right, because the, basically the lab notebook was the place where in court it would get decided who actually invented the thing first. And America is different from any other country. So now, so that is a relevant question to chemical informatics, right? So basically, we also are going to spend some time on this as a class, but you should go through these. Uh, describe 10 strategies for obtaining melting points. It's one of the things that you'll do. So, I mean, a lot of these are just details of the things I've already talked about today. Um, just trying to give you an idea for the the range. So in this one, <clears throat> describe 10 strategies for obtaining aqueous solubility data. We already talked about reaxis, but, you know, here's a bunch of suggestions. Of how to do it using ChemSpider, Subaldrich, etc. So describe the procedure to submit a new compound in ChemSpider. So I mean that's one of the things about ChemSpider is different is that its users can actually change the database, they can contribute. So if you're in the lab, for example, and you take an NMR of one of your starting materials or products, you can actually upload it on ChemSpider. So this question is basically how do you actually do that on ChemSpider? So you know, go go through these when you have a chance, and you know when we're when we're covering the actual topics, I will delve in more. I talked about inches and smiles, so here's an FAQ about what they are. So I would strongly recommend you go through the FAQs from the past couple of years just to get a feeling for things. And if you have anything that is not already there, you know, let me know. So this, for example, is probably different now. Five examples: smartphone applications. Uh, this is what it was last year. Uh, I had a student who was actually a high school teacher, so that's what she chose. Okay, so you want to make it something that you're actually interested in, preferably. And all of these will go into the final exam. They will be material for the final exam. That's worth 25%. Uh, yeah, so this is actually a, a, a pretty good one. You know, how do you specify chirality? I talked about that a little bit earlier with the at symbols and smiles. Uh, but there's, you know, depending on the nomenclature, you can have DNL, plus and minus. All, so all these things, uh, you know, a student of chemical information should know what all these things do and how to search for them. And basically what happens here, so as you're working on your FAQ, put it in your log page. I'll make comments there. 
and then when it's done, we'll just copy it over. So the only thing is you just want to make sure you don't have the identical question to someone else or have an identical question from a past year, unless there's been new developments for that question. You put them on your on your log page, so you, you put you put your uh, article summarization on the log page, and you put you put this on here too. So you know you pick a question from, from your mind. Yeah, I mean whatever you're, you're like. This student was interested in beer. Actually, just something we come up with. Yes. Okay. Or if you can't, after a couple of weeks, I'll give you something. But I prefer if you do it. Like this student was interested in the you know the chemistry of beer. And that turned out to be actually really interesting, and he also wrote his final paper on that. So, you know, as long as it is related to chemical information, I'm, I'm happy with it. Uh, speaking of which, I think I should probably show you some examples of that, what the papers look like. Okay, so this is just last year's wiki. And basically, this is what I mean by your name. Right. The reason I want you to start with your name is so that it sorts like this, so your log is next to your file. So this is the final paper of the student, and you got figures, and the references here. See how they're, they're DOIs, and they're, they they look like they're well formatted. So what I'm going to do is actually see your reference one, what you said, and then click on these and actually verify. I'll go through the paper and actually see. So if that that's what I was saying. If that link is dead, I have no choice but to remove a lot of points because I have no way of really quickly telling. Well, the DOIs are actually designed so that they don't fail, yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is actually a pretty good example for yeah, the formatting and everything. Um, so, yeah, you can go through these. You might actually be interested in some of these topics. Uh, the log, I think in this case, this student's was very short. So this is not a requirement for you to do that, but if you want to, you can ask me questions and I'll answer them like this. Uh, let's see, take a look at another... Okay, so, you know, it's kinds of things like if you use a figure, you need to reference where you got it from, you know, things that should be obvious, but just, you know, make sure that you, you do them. Let's take a look at this log. I think I might have a little bit more. All right, so here's the uh, FAQ the student did. And then I'll just put this down to let you know you're done. So this was the article summary. So each one of these bullet points is a paragraph in the paper that they were reading. And then the properties, you, you don't actually need to put anything for properties because you're putting them directly in the sheet. You can if you want to, but I'm only going to be looking at the master sheet for your uh, properties. So I would suggest go through some of these and see if you know if you see a style that a certain topic might give you an idea. Obviously, you can't do the same topic, but you know, it'll give you an idea of the style, the kinds of things that you can cover. Um, I, just, I think I covered everything. Yes. So basically, it would be. Let me go back to our wiki. Way to do it, but okay. So uh, after you log in, pages and files, and then it's just new page. And then here again, once you decide on your real name or your pseudonym, you would just put it there 
create one page, then either has final or something, and the other one would be the same thing but log, and that's it. Those are your two pages. And uh, and then once you have your page in, then you know you just hit edit. And I would suggest always go to the wiki text editor just to make sure that we don't run into that formatting problem. So. All right, let's say I'm editing this. So this is the default visual editor. What you want to do is on the save, hit the drop down to wiki text editor. And then your text, so basically it's very, very simple markup. The two equal signs mean heading one, the highest heading. If you put two equal signs, it's the second heading. And that's all really that you should have in your paper or anything. The rest should just be free text. If you want to link to something, right, you highlight it, and then you hit the link button, and then just paste the address, and it'll do it automatically for you. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So again, when we do workshops, I can help you out with, with stuff like that. But yeah. Okay. Well, we've been at it for two hours. I'm sure you guys are tired. So um, I'm going to do a little bit of a workshop for whoever wants to hang around. If you brought your laptop, you know, we could start on this. Uh, but that's it for the lecture part of today. Okay. If you have any other questions you want to discuss with me, come up. And again, think about, you know, picking your username.